ask you to bless each one here and that you would make them aware of what is needed and put our hands to work. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Shall we continue to pray? God of both the heavens and earth, we come in this moment, first of all, to say thank you for being a just God. Thank you for being a God that cares, a God that understands, and a God that knows how to meet us right where we are. In this moment, we yield to invite your presence, that thou would come in the mix of this place, and help us to be mindful that injustice anywhere is a threat still to justice everywhere. Help us, help us to be mindful that the work of justice must keep moving forward. Help us to keep, be mindful to still call out those things that should not be, that still exist in the world that we live in. We pray today that you will be in the mix, with, in the mix of us. We pray that you will even bless Reverend Barber even the more. That he'll continue to do thy work and thy will as you have anointed and assigned him to do in this season. We yield all of us. All of us fighters for justice and for righteousness, we yield all of us into your hands that we might leave this place today after this moment, continue to be effective servants in the earth and to do thy will. Bless us now in this moment, in thy name, amen. amen. Bishop Barber. Thank you so much, friend, for being to here today where none of us knew a week ago we would need to be. But thank you for answering the call to be here today. Thousands of people are joining us also by live stream. Before I begin, because this is really not just about me, I want to thank the clergy here and any clergy that want to come and stand doing this presentation a welcome but I want to first ask those with disabilities uh, if you would help them bring a chair and they can sit if they're able to just come and sit if you so choose my dear brother Arthur my brother if you want to come if you got a cane or anything wheelchair even if your disability is not seen but it's real and with those of you that are not differently able, help them with the chair, bring a chair up for them. Pastors, if any of you, because I know some of y'all have been standing many years. And so if you choose to, to just sit, it's fine. Thank you. you. Choose to just sit. And I want us first to take a moment and think about all the people in your family, on your jobs, in your churches, in community, that you know are differently abled. And yet, just like you, were created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. Could we take a moment and maybe even call their names. If they're past and gone, they're here, if they wanted to be here but they couldn't, I don't know what their disability or different ableness is, quadriplegic, blind, struggle with mental issues, whatever it is, God has made it clear to us in the scriptures in Psalm 18 that the real hope for a new world is when the stone that the builders reject become the chief cornerstone in the building of a brand new reality. I want to tell the media and those listening a story because I want truth to be out about why we're here. And I do appreciate your solemnness so everything ain't about cheering. <laughs> everything is not about clapping and celebrity. I'm not a celebrity. I'm a servant. That's how I was raised. Amen. My daddy raised me like that. But 
But on the day after Christmas, <coughs> two days after I had heard from my mother about how blessed she had been at the church, St. John Church of Christ, and her new pastor, Russell Wilkin, and how she had been so blessed. I took my 90-year-old mother to see the new color purple. We wanted to come, we had to come to Greenville because you all know in Eastern North Carolina there ain't a whole lot of theaters. <laughs> in our small rural towns like Roper, and Piney Woods, and Jamesville, and Bertie, and Chacawinity, Plymouth. We wanted to, we went to enjoy the music and the story of that movie of triumph mm -hmm. over adversity. And I'm normally not this personal, but if you would allow me today. The movie was a gift to my mother, who came to North Carolina as a government, federal government, administrative, and might have a tissue, professional in the 1960s to help integrate public schools with my father, who was asked to come here by E.V. Wilkins, former principal of what was then the all-black union school in Roper, North Carolina. Going to this movie this week was supposed to be a gift to me and a gift to her. She had said to me that she would love to spend some time with me because, you know, I'm always here and there. She travels sometime with me to Connecticut where I'm not teaching. But this year, for some reason, she said, I would love to spend Christmas with you alone. My baby brother died 30 days after being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer a few years ago. And so now I have returned to the status that I had for nine years when I was the only child. I thought my brother would bury me. I don't know how many more years I have left with my mother. My father's been gone since 1988. He had his struggles with disabilities. She's 90 years old. And for her, that's a miracle. Her mother died in childbirth. So even having me was a major step. My mother was afraid to have children. It's a major step of faith. Her mother died and she watched her mother bleed to death because the white hospital would not send the ambulance. So for her, her children are a sign of God's grace. This week was going to be our time of reminiscing, knowing, uh, Bishop Blow, that this would be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You know, a movie doesn't stay in the theater forever. It has a season, and then other movies come along. It won't be in the theater next Christmas. Right? This was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. The original plan was to see the movie on Christmas Day but then we chose the matinee, and truthfully, I knew it would be so many people there, and I know, you know, she's slower now, I'm slow, so I asked her would she mind doing matinee, not in the evening when most people come, but one o'clock, you know, two o'clock in the day, three o'clock. On Saturday, this coming Saturday, we're having a major celebration of her birthday, even though she was born in November, and on Saturday, in Piney Woods, a place most of you in the media may or may not know about. It's one of the few free 
communities, the communities that was always with free black folk, mulatto, black, and Native Americans in eastern North Carolina. And on that day, we're going to sing. And she said she wanted anybody in the community to come free, free food, free music. And the governor has decided to give her the order of the longleaf pine for her years of service in this state. So this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. This week was planned out. See the movie this week, this time, enjoy the reminiscing, and then on Saturday to have this big gathering at home, outside, under tent, we have the tissue. And then I had to get back on the road because I've got to preach on Sunday evening for a national watch night service in Winston-Salem. Excuse me. But our plans were interrupted when the managers of the AMC Theater here in Greenville chose to call the police rather than accommodate my visible disability. For more than 30 years now, I've suffered from a form of arthritis that's a rare, but one of the most dangerous forms, debilitating form, called ankylosing spondylitis. Most of you in here, I've never talked to you about it. All you just see me doing is pushing on through. I walk now with two canes. I have to carry a high chair with me everywhere I go because my hip is fused, part of my neck and spine, and I cannot bend to sit in a low chair nor rise from a low position. Now you may have seen me in a stacked chair at the airport, but those chairs are differently, built differently, it's still very painful. And whenever you see me, I have assistance, and many times what I'll do with the stack chair is get to the edge of the sidewalk so my feet are lower so the lift is not so high. But the pain is still extraordinary. <coughs> Ankylosing is a hard arthritic disease. No cure. 30 years I've battled it since I was 18. It messes with the spine. It's like a laser guided arthritis that targets weight bearing joints, targets the neck, the spine, targets other organs, kidneys, targets your, your rib cage. It can actually cause a collapsing of the rib cage and affect your heart. It can even give you something called iritis, where your eyes turn bloody red and you can't see until it moves. I've had that twice. And because I've dealt with it, I have some understanding about pain. Because from 1993 to 2005, the disease put me in the hospital for a long period of time. I had only been preaching at Greenlee Christian Church for uh, 30 days. And I preached a sermon the last Sunday in, in July entitled, When Giants Keep Coming, and how not, sometimes we not only have to face Goliath, but his cousins. Sermon that was inspired by, by uh, Sam Proctor. And that next Friday, I could not move. And I went into the hospital for weeks, came out, mobile device, walker, hurting. At that time, on a high dose of anti steroidal medicines that was dangerous to my health. But by God's grace, by the congregation, Green Bee Christian Church, they didn't throw me out because I was crippled. <laughs> we stayed together and prayed together for 12 years until, by God's grace, with the doctors and the therapists and my swim coach and the prayer warriors, I was able to return to using a cane. I fought back to standing, preaching, marching, working, enduring. In fact, one of the miracles I learned during that period of time is the only time I don't hurt is when I'm preaching. So y'all, forgive me for being long-winded sometimes. That's where it comes from. 
when I, I, I would be, when I was on a walk in a wheelchair, but when I would stand to go to the pulpit, turn the walker around for the next 45 minutes or an hour, however long praying and not, I felt no pain. Immediately afterwards, it felt like somebody had a butcher knife in my hip, twisting. When I swim, I don't hurt. And I say this even as I'm mindful that there are so many people in this world far more disabled, far, have disabilities far greater than mine, far greater, and are far more courageous than I am. People out here that, that are giants when it comes to courage. They get up every morning and face things that would cause cowards to, to roll over and quit. And they are my heroes and sheroes. I visited them in the hospital with that same chair, by the way, that I tried to take. I've taken that same chair in the hospital rooms and laid hands on people and prayed for them. And I've seen people who inspire me. And many of them are courageous without guaranteed health care. How sickening is that? Especially in this nation. Huh? No health care. Some of them no caretakers. They don't have a staff or a team. Come on over, brother. Come on, I don't know. It's one of the great sins of our time. Yes. When people claim to love God and love Jesus, who never charged a leper a copay, but we can't figure out how to give everybody health care. Yes, sir. But I do know about pain. I know about fear, the fear that people might not accept you because of your pain or your disability, the fear of falling and wondering if anybody will be around to help you, the fear of not wanting to be alone in a room or at night, the fear of crying in public so you get alone, so you can cry. I know the shame. Because people can say some of the ugliest things when you're disabled. I went somewhere one time to preach and somebody, I heard them, you know, because they can't whisper. They said, mm, he looked like he needed to be in a hospital, not at the pulpit. And then after I finished preaching, they had all of these adulations and I just said, wow. I know about wrestling with medicines and having to look at, you take one medicine, but what's the side effect? I know about wanting to do things with your children or your sons and you can't do it. I know about calling the name of Jesus because it worked, but also saying, what the hell, damn it, because that helps sometimes too. I know about what it means to take steroids and I mean, uh, steroids and that struggle. I know what it's like to take anti-steroidal, anti inflammation but then you have to worry about, will it eat your stomach out? Will it cause you to bleed? Anybody knows what I'm talking about? Y'all yes. Know? Yes. And I know about opioids. I have not talked about this. I know about the struggle of opioids. I'm on them right now. Right now. And I know about the challenges of depression. When I was disabled by this disease, as a young man, I had to battle a serious depression. I thought my life was over. People told me, you can't be a preacher and can't walk. You can't do civil rights and can't walk. You know, people want folk that stand up straight. They want a certain image. I was told that. I thought I would have to live out the remainder of my days off in a nursing home bed or something. But it was my mother who's a pianist and an organist, who came to the hospital and played hymns while a team of doctors and therapists came to show me that though my body was broken, I could learn a new way of moving in the world. In fact, in my book, I talk about how I was visited by what I call an amputated angel who told me, you're, not, you're gonna limp like Israel. You're gonna limp and you're gonna have to get over even the vanity of it all. And looking back, I now understand that my public ministry, because I'm not perfect by long shot, but my perf public ministry has been shaped by an attentiveness to the vulnerable, 
because I wake up every morning with vulnerability. And, and my ministry is shaped by attentiveness to vulnerable that I might have never appreciated had I not experienced this and continue to experience. And I don't know where it will end. All I have learned is that when you have a thorn and you keep asking it to be removed, God's grace is somehow sufficient. Yes, yes. And when you're weak, God is somehow strong. Today I teach students who are preparing for ministry at Yale Divinity School and I tell them they must work hard to understand the Bible, theology, history, and pastoral practice if they are to take up the ministry of Jesus. But I also tell them you must do more than just know the word, you must watch people. Yes, yes, yes. Good, Bishop. You can do all the preaching in the world, but if you don't have love and care about people, and that there's no way to follow Jesus without learning to pay attention to whoever is broken and sleep vulnerable sleep in society. Because that's where God shows up. Yes, yes, yes. In Bethesda on the porches. Yes. In the fields with the shepherds. Yes. Where the leopards are. Yes. Where the graveyards are. And people are sleep hiding out there. Yes, sir. This is why morally and theologically this whole thing is bigger than me. See, the law is clear. And for two managers to wrongfully make this decision, and I've deliberately not called their names, and I will not because I don't want them, I'm praying for them even now. There you go. It should have never been a police escalation situation. Never been threatened to be charged with trespassing. First of all, I paid the call. <laughs> And paid to make sure that they had the handicapped spaces that are that, 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 that sometimes are present in theaters. The law is clear. Title III prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in the activities of places of public accommodation. Businesses that are generally open to the public and that fall into one of 12 categories, restaurants, movie theaters, schools, daycare facilities, recreation facilities, doctor's offices, and require newly constructed or altered places of public accommodation. This is what the law says. And it took a lot for this law to come into existence because it used to be for disabled folk, go somewhere, get out of the way, and let the rest of us do what we want to do. Yes, yes. But beyond the law, Yes, yes, it is the law, the law rooted in the 14th Amendment that says equal protection under the law for all persons, not all citizens, all persons, regardless of your race, your color, your creed, your sexuality. The promise of the preamble that the goal of this nation is to establish justice and promote the general welfare of all. Mm -hmm. But beyond all of that, the word of God yes. tells us how we're supposed to treat those who are differently able. Mm -hmm. Matthew 25 and 40 says, I'm going to judge you by how you treat the least of these. Yes, Leviticus 19 and 14 says, You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, mm -hmm. but you shall fear the Lord. In other words, to fear God means you treat people right that are differently yes. able. Yes. And Luke chapter 14 says that Jesus told a parable and said to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, and I could insert a movie, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives, lest they also invite you in return. But when you give a feast, a public event, invite the poor, yes. the crippled, yes. the lame, the blind, yes. and then you will be blessed. Yes. Because they cannot repay you. Yes. To call the police, armed police, and an armed security guard, whom I'm not even sure what his training is, mm -hmm. could have escalated into something more dangerous yes. if it had not possibly been somebody like me who's trained in nonviolent resistance. And let me say here that the police in this instance were asked to do something they should have not been asked to do. And in this instance, they handled it professionally. Amen. I've spoken with the Greenville Chief of Police who has been gracious, kind, attentive. His officers that night were the same. In fact, I could tell they didn't even want to be there. 
I could tell it by their body language, their eyes, and even what they said. As soon as I was outside, they said they were sorry and left. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I ain't pressing no charge. And the reason I left is because they said that the manager said if they arrest me, they'd have to clear the whole theater. And I didn't want to mess up everybody's stuff. So I said, well, you know, if you take me out, because I can't get up and walk out. My conscience wouldn't let me do that. Huh? The chief had asked me uh, that we sit down and talk, and I told him I would with some clergy and different races, faith, disabilities. I hope to talk further about what kind of changes can be made in law enforcement policies so that when the police can tell managers who are abusing their power, we ain't getting involved in this and leave. I'm not ashamed of being differently able. The Bible tells me that a whole lot of folk God used with differently aids. Moses had disability. Paul had disability. Jesus was acquainted with sorrow. World history. Harry Tubman had a disability. Fanny Crosby had a disability who wrote at the cross, at the cross. Roosevelt, President Roosevelt had a disability. Isaac Watts who wrote Joy to the World had a disability. President Kennedy, Fannie Lou Hamer. How many of you have people in your families? How many people in your churches? How many of you have disabilities you don't even talk about? So I'm not ashamed, and I'm not ashamed of this chair. I have to use. Put that chair. It's been on Broadway. No, put, no, not under me. Put it right here. It's been in the Lion King. It's been in the White House. It's been at Congress when I prayed to open the, 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 the house in Congress. It's been in restaurants. It's been in uh, mama kitchens and, and fancy restaurants. It's been everywhere. Hallelujah, chair. It's been everywhere. <laughs> it was on stage with me when uh, Taraji Henson premiered the movie in Durham. What was that movie called? Uh, uh, Goodbye Enemies, right? Um, huh? Best of Enemies. So, Best of Enemies. When I talked about her on stage, and then I took the same chair and put it down in the aisle and watched the premiere of that movie. I've been in their theaters before. What's shameful is in the midst of all the issues we face, war, 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, 50 million people not making living wages, almost 49% of North Carolina's population not making a living wage, 87 million people without health care, 4 million people getting up every day that can buy unleaded gas, can't buy unleaded water, millions of people facing homelessness and eviction, Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, racism, racism toward people with disabilities, people wrongfully incarcerated, all the real stuff we have to deal with. Yes, sir. And all I wanted to do was spend a very sentimental time with my 90-year-old mother and two managers feel with all the real stuff we need to be dealing with that the proper use of their power is to refuse, as the law requires, ADA accommodations. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This is absurd, y'all. Yes, yes, and the danger of describing a black man as arguing and trans tra trespassing and having two armed police officers and an armed security officer come could have had bad results in the wrong hand. Mm -hmm. You know, some years ago, a boy with Down syndrome got killed in the theater because they didn't handle it right. Now, I am encouraged, members of the media, by Brother Aaron, the CEO or chairman of AMEC, reaching out. He reached out, asked that he would come and meet with me in Greenville. We plan to talk extensively. AMC is the largest theater chain in the world over 10,000 screens. They served over 250 million people uh, last year. He made it clear this is not the way AMC is supposed to work. I told him, I said, you know, I'm in a movie called God and Country. It was produced by Rob Reiner. It comes out in February. So while my chair didn't get in the theater, my face will probably be in there. <laughs> I actually opened that movie. Yes. Hope y'all will come. But this is not about me personally. Though it happened to me personally, this is about what systemic changes and policy changes to training need to be done to ensure this happens to no one. 
AMC should mean this. When somebody sees AMC, that it should mean I know they will accommodate me caringly. Mm -hmm. AMC. Mm -hmm. Now one of the managers asked me why was I making a big deal of this? Mm. Yeah, literally. Really? Oh. oh yeah, why are you making a big deal about this? Yeah. Well, the promises of liberty and equality are a big deal. The democratic practice that requires accommodations for the differently able is a big deal. Yes, yes. We do not do this as, as a concession to the demands of some who refuse to be silent. We commit to it as a people because we believe we are better with the contribution of everybody in society. Yes, yes. When the managers of AMC Theater told me I could not use the chair that allows me to participate in public life, I did not challenge them simply because I wanted to see a movie with my mother. While that is true, it was wrong. It's constitutionally wrong. It's morally wrong. It's ethically wrong. They said, no matter how much I explain, your chair can't come in. Your chair is a fire hazard. No, the chair isn't a fire hazard. Where you place it is a fire hazard. If it was fire, I couldn't have taken it in hospitals and, and, and White House and, and, and Broadway. It's where you place it. It's called accommodation. Huh? They said, no matter how much I explain, I called 911 when I saw the security guy with the gun, and I'm like, what kind of training? I called them and asked them, can y'all send somebody over here to explain, to help them understand this is wrong? They said, we don't get involved in that. But I was worried about the whole escalation of what was going on. They called for arrest and eventually described me as arguing and disturbing, not debating what they were doing. They asked the police to remove me. One said, and if he doesn't leave, charge him with trespassing. The other manager also said, you need to go get a note from your doctor and then come back. <laughs> One of, both of them said, we know who you are. And that's when it triggered me that this was bigger than me. Because if you would do this to me. My mind. Say Bishop. And I've already heard from a couple clergy in this city who said they have some information about some other persons who have been impacted. I'm not ready to talk about the names or anything. They summoned the officers with guns. They caused me to leave my mother, 90 years old, with an attendant and a young girl who still today is trying to figure out what was this all about. She, in fact, has a disability herself. When the Greenville police escorted me out, they actually said they were sorry and left the scene. Then the managers brought their security guard out again with his gun that I'm not sure how he's even trained, to tell me that my driver and I had to leave the premises, could not wait on my mother, and even told the news reporter, I don't know if she's here today, there she is right there. They told her she had to leave. The news reporter, am I lying? Told you had to go. I'm like, what in the world? And then, I'm not releasing it today, but we have the film of one of them, as my driver helped me get in the car, taunting like this. As though you had accomplished something. I challenge them because I know that if I cannot sit in my chair in a theater in Greenville, North Carolina, that, that we work this out with my doctor, because I can't sit low, I can't sit in a wheelchair, that there are thousands of other people who will be excluded from public spaces in this nation. One of the managers suggested, as I said, I needed to go and come back. What's the big deal? Well, civil rights and disability rights are a big deal. Title III, as I close, of the ADA, which prescribes discrimination on the basis of disability in public accommodation, tracks 
Title II of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. You should know that. This law follows the same theory of law that gave us the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was passed after the March on Washington, after the girls were blown up in the church in Birmingham, and after the push of 1964 and marching where black and white and brown folks stood together. So Title III of ADA law is in that same genre. Same genre. It tracks the 14th Amendment. Y'all been hearing about the 14th Amendment? 14th Amendment, 1868, was passed to say all persons have a right to equal protection under law. Every law we have, whether it's child labor laws, whether it's union laws, whether it's women's rights or disabled rights, they all flow out of the 14th Amendment. If there had not been a 14th Amendment that was passed first to protect former slaves, white women, white men, white boys and girls, brown, black, Asian, and others would not be afforded some of the civil rights they have today. Amen. Disabled people wouldn't be afforded. And this act, the ADA Act, owes its birthright not to any one person. People worked for years. They sent alerts, they draft legislation, they testified, they negotiated, they filed lawsuits. They stood up in places, they sat down in places, they wouldn't move from places. They fought, they stood, they engaged in nonviolence to say, you will not push us to the corner. Yes, yes. You will not block us from coming just because we're differently able. Come on. They built a movement. They built a movement. They built a movement. They went in the halls of Congress. They went into the courts. They didn't quit. And it's bipartisan legislation. This ain't about Republican and Democrat. It was filed by Senator Tom Harkin. It was signed by George Bush. Yes. But it has helped many a thousand. And it still needs to be strengthened. Am I right? Yes. Because things are still happening. Yes, they are. Still happening. Bring my brother right on up here. And finally, I want to say something that hurt my mother to her core, hurt me to my core, and I've not said to this point. All that I just said that happened, the managers who did this were not white. They were minorities. One was an African-American woman. The other, I'm not sure, I think, is uh, maybe Latino or mixed. But if you uh, don't like wrong, wrong is just wrong. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. It made my mother ask why, with tears in her eye, why would persons Yolanda, bring that statement up if you've got it from mom. You have it? Where's Yolanda? Why would persons who have benefited from the civil rights law? In our world wait, wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. Benefited from other people's fighting. Benefited. Why would two minorities be so insensitive yes. and so determined not to comply with the law? And I say that clearly today. While I served uh, the national NAACP in the state, I've not asked the NAACP or requested their help in this because this is not about race. It's not about where somebody white did this. Right. My moral support in this comes from, first of all, the clergy and the people right in this community. The first ones to call, like Bishop Blow, this pastor here, Cassandra, all the folk here. I won't call Dave, where's Kevinina? He was in here others who are in the disabled community. I have secured counsel and consultation. My hope is by meeting with the president, none of that stuff will be needed, because really what I want to see is some systemic change. It's not about me. Some systemic change that changes things all over the nation. Yes. For those, all over where those 10,000 screens are. This ain't about nothing but that. But I do have National Civil Rights Attorney Harry Daniels, the offices of Harry M. Daniels in Atlanta, and Maria Town, the president and CEO of the American Association of People with Disabilities, to come alongside his counsel, along with attorney Scott Holmes at the Civil Rights Center at my alma mater, North Carolina Central University. 
And so they're going to give counsel and consult. But our first, my first goal is to meet with the president directly. Mm -hmm. you know, and to look at this and see where we, what, what needs to be done to adjust it because this should have never happened. Amen. And it doesn't matter if it happened, if it was black on white, black on black, Asian on Asian, Latino on Latina. I learned a long time ago, wrong is just wrong. Yes, yes, yes. Huh? And you cannot be morally inconsistent. You know, if it happened to be white on black, there'd be an outrage, but if not, no, 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 no. Wrong is wrong. So I wanted to clear everything up. We meet on Tuesday right here in Greenville. We will keep you posted. If you want to have updates, you can go to Repairs of the Breach, www breach repairs. And you know what? We're going to keep right on limping. All right. And while I'm limping, I'm going to sing, because I don't hurt when I sing either. Sing, Bishop. So that's why sometimes when I preach, I sing and preach. They call it hooping. That's what they call it. But I'm going to keep on limping with you all, and wherever there's an injustice, just say, ain't going to let nobody turn around. Ain't going to let nobody make me take my chair home. Ain't going to let nobody tell me where we can't come because we differently are able. Do I have a witness in the house? Is there anybody else just like me? Ain't going to let nobody dismiss your humanity. Ain't going to let nobody think they can treat you different because you have a cane or a walker or because you can't see or because of how you have a disability. Ain't going to let nobody God made me I belong here. I got a right to a seat in the place. I got a right to accommodation. I have a right to be respected. It didn't come first from the Constitution. It came first from God. When God made me a little bit lower than the angel. Oh, hallelujah. Fill me with the power of his spirit. The Constitution is second, but my God right is first. I ain't going to let nobody. The only time you can take my chair is when I die and get to heaven. Come on now. And I go to the tree that got healing in its leaves. No oh, hallelujah. Then you can take my chair here. Because I'm going to have another chair at the welcome table. When the saints go marching in. I wish I had a witness here. Oh, but until then. Until then I'm fighting. Until then I'm standing. Until then I'm praying. Until then I'm loving. Until then, I'm helping everybody I can help. Nobody, as long as God is God, is going to turn us around. Would y'all listen to my mama for a second? In our world today, I find that we do not have compassion for one another. And I think if we get back to the rival way, we will look on others that it could be you in the same predicament. And I think we should show love and care for one another. Before we respond to other people who are disabled, we need to put ourselves in their shoes, walk in their shoes, and see how they feel. Uh, we need to be guided by God's love. God shed his blood for all of us that we might have a lot of right to the tree of life. And love is the most important thing. As Jesus walked this earth, he showed love to everybody. Uh, and I think that we as a nation should do the same thing. Help somebody as you pass this way. That's right. This song could be our motto. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word of song, if I can show somebody that he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. Amen. In our world today, I find that we Amen. do not have... Amen, Mama. <laughs> Amen. Are there questions from members of the media? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you are? I'm Pat Greer with the Daily Reflector here in Greenville, sir. Yes, sir. Um, at what point is the public apology and the private apology that was given to you by AMC, at what point do you think that might be accepted? Oh, I've already accepted the apology. But that's not the issue. 
The apology is the beginning. The shift in policy changes is the final. And so that's why we're having this serious conversation beginning on Tuesday, not be one, not just one time, but a very serious conversation that the chairman and president and CEO actually called for. And uh, I've actually talked to him several times since then. Uh, I, I believe uh, he's serious. Uh, he's sincere. Uh, we'll see if he's serious. And I, wanna, I believe that. Uh, it does him no good to have people acting out like this at his theaters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't do the city any good. It doesn't do anybody any good. You know? Uh, um, <laughs> you know, if you go into these theaters now, they actually have areas cut out for, for handicapped chairs and scooters. And, and things are changing. Like, the one time we only had wheelchairs. Now we have chairs for quadriplegics that will stand them all the way up. What are you going to do, say they can't come in? So the accommodations understanding has to follow. And, and no CEO uh, wants people going around making his or her organization look foolish. Mm -hmm. See, first of all, before this is discrimination, it was foolish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unnecessary. That's right. You know, if I, my grandma was here, she said it was trifling. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just make it just easy. I mean, who in here would, if somebody came to your house and they had a chair, wouldn't make accommodation for them? That's right. That's right. Instead, make who of y'all would call the cops? You know, and tell them they trespass after you invite them. Because see, when you put up your, when you say the color purple is here, you're saying you invited people to yes. come. Yes, sir. Yes. Your advertisement right. is yes. an invitation. Yes. And you didn't say on the invitation, come unless. Right, mm -hmm. and then try to make it something that it isn't, like violation of fire code. No, so if a violation of fire code, I couldn't bring the chair in here. Mm -hmm. I couldn't take it nowhere. It's not, the violation would be if you were in the aisles blocking folk, that kind of stuff. Nobody would ever ask that. I'm not foolish enough to ask for that. In fact, on some occasions when I've gone to the different places, they will say, okay, we're just gonna put you up against the wall. I don't care. All right. Mm -hmm. Put the chair up against the wall. Mm -hmm. I wanna see. Thank God my eyes are still good. Amen. <laughs> I can see. And they're brown, too. Amen. Yes, sir. I used to use them when I was in college, you know, with the girls. <laughs> Those on. days are gone now. Come on, preacher. <laughs> but my point is, I just wanted to see and hear and enjoy. And really because that story was about triumph, you know. And my family, you know, has been through so much. You know, I, I don't want to tell all of this story. My, my grandfather was a coal miner in West Virginia who stood with white coal miners in the 1920s fighting for, for, for wages when they had Molotov cocktails dropped on top of them from planes flying over by the managers who rather than give them their wages actually ended up killing some of those coal miners. That's my grandfather's history. So our family has had its challenges. So the color purple draws us to that. Right, it's, it, 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 it reminds us of that. So, um, we got work to do, but meeting with the police chief, meeting with the, um, I believe, as I said, he's sincere. We'll know if he's serious, and, uh, and uh, we have counsel, but counsel is not, you know, like the big bad, anything to counsel, is because it, this, this is a matter of law. Mm -hmm. It's not even a matter of my personal opinion. You know, to, in fact, to not demand that the law be properly enforced would be to violate the law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so we should want this and even more. Watch this. Just for a moment, I want everybody to forget what your position is. How many of you have somebody in your family that's differently able? You see how even the media got this raised now? Every one of us knows this. Every one of you have somebody who, when y'all are around the house, and you say, hey, let's go so-and-so, they say this. Oh, y'all go ahead, I'll be all right. And they don't say it because they don't want to go. Mm -hmm. They say it because they've not yet mustered the psychic strength necessary mm -hmm. to go. Say, mm -hmm. So they feel like they're a burden. Yep. I know that. I've done that. People didn't know I've done it, but I've done it because I, I didn't talk about it. 
and everybody leaves, and then you cry in the house mm -hmm. by yourself. You know what I'm talking about? Because you want to go, but you don't. But you're afraid that somebody's gonna do something crazy, or you're gonna hinder them, or or even your family members might want to go somewhere and you can't go, so you weep, right? Until somebody comes along and says, "You know what? We only going where you can go." All right. And when they do that, it changes your yeah. life. Yeah. 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 It changes your whole life. When I've gone to pulpits and the steps were built high, and the pastor says, "But we put we're gonna put the pulpit down on the floor." Mm -hmm. Oh God! Come on, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I preach till I can walk up the step. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. You know, or when I was in the National Cathedral and you got to climb about 16 steps, and the attendant said, "I'll hold your hand," mm -hmm. so that you can stand the same place Dr. King stood. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it takes you 15 minutes to climb the steps. Mm -hmm. Once you get up there, it's not your legs we want to see. It's your heart and your mouth yes. we want to hear. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. So all of us know this, y'all. Mm -hmm. And if, if, we got a, if we got any hope as a society, we've got to return, we've got to somehow gain, I don't even say recover, a sense of compassion <laughs> and put a face on these realities. Yes. You know, poverty is the fourth leading cause of death right now in America. Poverty. The things we ought to really be talking about in a, in a political season should be things that matter, not hate and craziness. And even whether people are Democrat or Republican, where do you stand when it comes to people? Yes, Amen. that's good. Particularly the least of these. Because at the end of the day, that's how every nation and every city, and every country, and every county is going to be judged. Yes. And not just in the afterlife, because if you don't treat the least of these right now, you're never going to be able to even fix the society now, because it's going to always implode on top of the weight of its own insensitivity, its own hatefulness. Right? And so, I hope in the midst of all of this, we become more and more and more, not just as a theater, but in the, in the, in the film of life. All right, yes, sir. In the film of life. And that when the credits end on your life, because one day it will, the credits will say, because you live, yes. somebody weight was a little lighter. Somebody's breathing was a little better. Yes, yes. Somebody's tears were a little less. Yes, and somebody's hope grew mm -hmm. because you mm -hmm. did not dismiss them, yes. but welcomed them. Is there anyone else? Yes, sir. I'm Jeff with ABC 11. Just a question. Did you ever feel like you were you know, impeding traffic or... You know, blocking the aisle or blocking somebody's view? And did AMC ever try to reaccommodate you or did they just go straight to calling you? No, I never was. I wouldn't. See, remember, I was the human relations director for the state of North Carolina. So I know the law and I know I'm, I have fought for people. You know, the, first, the first time I sued somebody as human relations director was when I sued a white landowner who wouldn't let a white woman with babies rent his trailers. <laughs> You know? So it would be stupid of me to create a high fire house because I'd be the one burn up. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it's just illogical. So as I shared with them, when I was on Broadway recently, looking at the Lion King, the maitre d' came down, and I, and, and I even said, no. He said, oh, no, no. And they grabbed the chair, and they seated it right where it needed to be. And I always look for those little openings. And if that's not there, normally the management will say, well, Reverend Baba, can you just either come over here against the wall or come over here? But no, that was no. That wasn't, it was no. Which is probably why, why I decided just to walk on in and sit down. Because I, I kept hearing them say no to other people that may not have the gravitas and strength. And sometimes you got to ask not 
You, you have to say this, you have to say, it's not that this happened to me, but why did it happen to me particularly? And sometimes it's just your cross for the moment that some other things might be opened up. Any others? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm uh, Gabby Sartori with WTT Channel 9. Mm -hmm. um, this whole situation, as you mentioned before, has brought up issues with the promise of liberty and equality. I wanted to ask what you hope to speak about on Tuesday to address these issues and what you hope to hear. Well, let me say broadly about liberty, equality, the ADA law, what it means, what it has to mean in these changing times in theaters in places of public accommodation. I have to reserve exactly what I'm going to talk about as a promise to the chair, president. When someone asks to meet with you confidentially, uh, as your first step, you have to honor that. Now, it doesn't mean if something's said during the confidential that's wrong, you wouldn't come out and tell it. But, but you have to first at least honor that. And so I'm honoring the fact that he reached out and said in his apology what he does not want AMC to represent. Now we must talk about, and he said it in his open letter, what kinds of adjustments and changes have to be made, see? Because what this cannot be is about a personality. Because then that even worsens the situation. If, if, if the issue is we're gonna treat you right based on your personality or your popularity, then that's another form of discrimination mm -hmm. that you cannot see. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's your uncle. You know, who, who may not be interviewed by you. He has a right, right? And so that's what we gotta talk about. And we're talking about it both from a business standpoint and from a policy standpoint. We need CEOs that will testify before Congress yes. and call for the strengthening yes, of the law. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm working with a group of CEOs now that believe in a living wage. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't have everybody of wealth be on the side of greed. You know, we are, um, uh, in the Bible, Jesus, what's his name that he borrowed the tomb from? Preachers, he borrowed the, borrowed the, borrowed the tomb. Mm -hmm. When in Jesus, he borrowed the tomb from a rich man. You've all, you, you always got to have some folk of means, mm -hmm. right, who, who see their means like John Hopkins. Like John Hopkins, who founded John Hopkins University, he said, my wealth is my ministry. Mm -hmm. all right. My so, wealth is my obligation. Mm -hmm. I didn't get this by myself. And so I have a responsibility to use it to make a difference. So I'm, I'm not naive at all, but I'm, I'm open and hope, hopeful to sit down and meet with uh, Brother Aaron. And I chose to call him that. I'm not calling him CEO. He chose to call me Brother Bob. I called him, but we took off the titles. Because right. in this instance, this ain't nothing but about plain, old, simple humanity. Yes. That's it. That's good. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with titles and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just the Title Three ADA does not say if you a bishop. <laughs> it does not say if you got degrees from North Carolina Central and Duke University and Drew and all that. It does not say if you're a CEO and got me. It just says if you are a disabled person. It doesn't even say citizen. Person. 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 Then here are the kinds of accommodations that M-U-S-T, not can be made, not ought to be made, not should be prayed about being made, but must be made. And you do not have to pre-order, just like at McDonald's. You ain't got to come say, I'd like a McDonald's, a, 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 a Big Mac, but you, when you get to the window, they accommodate you. So don't be fooled if somebody says, well, you know, he should have called in advance. I've got some facts on that I'm not going to talk about right now, but the truth of the matter is you don't have to. The law doesn't say that. All the law says you got to be a, a human being and show up. That's it. Because once you start putting poll taxes on it, see, well, if you call in advance, or if you got this kind of chair, well, well, then see what you're doing is further deepening the stigma and further creating the crisis and causing more discrimination. Yes. We don't want more discrimination. We want less. Anyone else? I wanted the media. I wanted the media. Yes, sir. Hi, um, we got reports that some people are going to be bringing their own chairs to theaters. Um, do you think that's an appropriate response? I leave things up like that to people's moral consciousness. 
Whatever you do, do it in love. Do it nonviolently. Do it in peace. Make sure you need it. Don't just show up there now. You know, goodness, where you don't need that chair. See, I can't sit in the chair in that recliner or anything. It has to be something that you need because of your disability. This is not about um, making a spectacle. This is about making a difference, right? And believe you me, if we don't see a difference, there are a number of things we can do, but we're not there yet. That's not where we are. And so if you are like my brother and I, you know, and, 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 and whatnot, and, um, and, and you have a need and you want to go to the movies, then you go. And I pray to God that they will accommodate you. Amen. That's my prayer. They should. You know, because if you think about it, it makes sense financially. Because most people that have a need got to bring somebody with them. So somebody that doesn't need a need, they go by themselves. That's one ticket. <laughs> you know, and mo most people that have a need got to have two, three people, sometimes two, three people. So it's actually financially foolish not to welcome people who have some form of disability, right? Because they have to have what's called caretakers. And caretakers, Kathy, pay too, right? <laughs> You see how foolish this is? When you, when you really start thinking about it, yes. it really doesn't make any sense. But it had to happen because it's some, it's, I have to believe it's going on somewhere else. Yes. Something else happens. Somebody's afraid. Yes. And it may not even be in a theater. It may be something else. That's right. And this is going to give some folk courage to activate that law yes. and, and walk into their promise. My life has been about helping. If my life has not been about being perfect and somebody that people can point to and say, he's the, 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 the stuff. No, I'm like y'all. I got my flaws. And stuff. But my life at least has been about helping people walk into their promise. Yes. Huh? We used to sing and say, what God has for me. It is for me. It is for me. And if I'm here, then I got a right to be here. Yes. Yes. I'm going to leave the poet, but would y'all turn to your neighbor and say, I got a right to be here. Say, tell them, say, the Lord said it. The Lord said it. I got a right to be here. Right to Can't be nobody, nobody, nowhere, nowhere. No, time, no time, no how, no, no, situation, no situation, no amount of money, no amount of money. can take my being here yeah. from being here. Because yeah. God put me here. God bless you all. Let the pastors close us out in prayer. Again, let us pray as one. Most gracious God, we give, again, give thanks to you. We give thanks for this time that we can be together. Most especially, we give thanks for the message we received today. May we take it out in our hearts but more importantly, with our hands, and make it so. Bless us now as we travel to our various destinations and continue to be your effective servants in the earth. In thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.